Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Meeting Owl by Owl Labs, a 360 degree video conferencing camera. Visit owllabs.com slash twist and use promo code twist at checkout to get free expedited shipping as a gift. And Squarespace, check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code twist to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I think we'll be sitting here 20 years from now and she will be in the top 10 investors, top five investors uh, of this generation. I paid him to say that. No, you didn't. No, it's just, I, I can tell there's people who are in it for the right reason, the hard work. And that's what we try to do is have the people who do the hard work and who are really smart come to these events. So please welcome Clara Brenner. That was the best intro I've ever gotten. Thanks. Hi, guys. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm really looking forward to learning about all of your businesses. Um, and today, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about eliminating deal breakers as you raise your Series A. And I hope none of you were at scale recently because I already gave this talk once. Um, but basically, there are a lot of ways to get a business off the ground and to grow that business. Um, there are many different paths. There are many steps along the way. But one step that many entrepreneurs aspire to take is to raise a Series A. Um, and have, maybe I could just canvas the room. Um, how many of you have raised a Series A? How many of you are pre-Series A? Great. Okay. So... Before I jump in, why don't I give you just a brief background on me. So I run the Urban Innovation Fund. We're a venture capital firm here in San Francisco. We invest in startups that are shaping the future of cities. So that could take a, a variety of industry verticals into account. It could be transportation, utility management, the future of work, early childhood education, uh, everything in between. But we're a pre-seed and seed stage investor. So we typically write checks somewhere between 100 and 500K initially into a business. Um, so I founded the fund, but previously before, uh, the urban innovation fund, I was investing through a vehicle called Tumble, which is an accelerator, um, also focused on, on urban businesses. So like you see chariot, uh, around the city, we were their first investor or neighborly, which is like a crowd investing platform for municipal bonds. So again, all in the urban space, um, and all at the early stage. Um, so I guess you could say that at this point, I've seen lots of businesses get off the ground and a lot of businesses try and some succeed at raising a Series A. Um, so uh, maybe to kind of set the stage, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page um, about the Series A landscape. Uh, the Series A crunch is a thing. It's real. Um, and there are two primary reasons for it. Um, the first is the democratization of the seed round. So between you know crowdfunding, bootstrapping, uh, Bitcoin, uh, angels, micro VCs, VCs, there's lots of ways to get off the ground. Um, and, uh, you can do it without really interacting with any institutional investors. So this means that one, um, a series A could be the first time you're dealing with professional investors, either sort of micro VCs or VCs. Um, but it also means there are a lot of other companies that just like you are able to find really scrappy ways to get off the ground and they're going to be competing with you for those series A dollars. And at the same time, uh, fewer deals are getting done right now than even just a few years ago. So um, according to the National Venture Capital Association, 8,000 venture deals were done uh, last year, which is a 22% year over year decline. Um, so just as there are more you know, startups out there competing for the Series A, uh, there are fewer <laughs> Series A deals that are getting done. Um, so just something to keep in mind as you prepare for the Series A, it really means that you need to think carefully about how you're going to prepare to compete in this extremely competitive landscape. Um, so today, I just kind of want to walk you through some common pitfalls that I see entrepreneurs make all the time when they're preparing for this Series A um, and kind of talk you through how do you prepare your business, how do you prepare your team to go through that process, um, and then, of course, learn to deal with the setbacks that inevitably will come your way. It's never going to be a smooth process, so sort of figuring out the most productive way to pick yourself up and move forward. Sound good? Yeah, okay. Deal breaker number one, 
no business fundamentals. Um, it is critical that you understand your own numbers, your run rate, your burn rate, your headcount, number of customers, whatever the KPIs are for your business. You need to understand them. You need to know them off the top of your head and you need to be able to speak knowledgeably about them to anyone. Um, and of course, that also includes understanding the sort of business landscape in which you're operating. So the revenue thresholds for your business are really important. It's something that Series A investors are going to take into account. So if you're a software as a service business, you are likely going to hear Series A investors say that they want you to be doing at least a million in annual recurring revenue. Although frankly, this year has been kind of crazy. And so it could be more like two or three, depending upon your, your specific vertical. Um, if you're not a SaaS business, um, the revenue expectations will vary pretty widely, but they're pretty high. And I imagine they'll probably be over a million in annual revenue. Um, but even if you have awesome revenue, uh, that probably isn't going to be enough. Um, something you hear a lot of Series A investors talk about is lumpy revenue. That is a deal breaker. Um, what they mean by that is basically um, whether you're recurring or not, when they look at your financials, they don't want to see it sort of spiking wildly from month to month or quarter to quarter. They want to be able to look at your numbers and see that you have long-term relationships with your customers, that you're charging them consistent pricing, um, that they're not just doing some kind of like six-month pilot or whatever. They want to know that, you know, okay, I can see your historical financials for the last year. That's going to give me a pretty strong sense of confidence that the next six months I, I can model out and it's not going to be hugely off. Um, so that's a real um, challenge. If you can't hit those thresholds, you will likely fall into the seed extension category, which it sounds like you guys were talking about a little bit before, um, AKA seed two, seed plus, seed whatever you want to call it. Um, it essentially is uh, buying you time to get to the threshold or the metrics that you need in order to raise a series A. And frankly, it's usually your last shot. Um, so um, it tends to have new participants. It's not usually just an insider round. It can vary in size, but um, we see them, especially these days, they're pretty common. Um, they can be pretty big, sometimes even larger than your previous round. We usually see them somewhere between like one and $3 million. Um, they tend not to have huge markups. Um, they could be priced or not. Um, we, we see a huge variety, but the entrepreneurs that we see be most effective when it comes to a seed extension are framing it as an opportunity to buy into the Series A at a discount. So finding a way to incentivize um, your investors to and new investors to think of this as basically like, I'm almost there. Yeah, I just need a few more months. Um, and this is an opportunity and not just like a, a pity a pity fundraise is a, is, is a good idea. Uh, another deal breaker, raising multiple rounds at once. I know this sounds stupid, but we get pitched on this all the time. This idea of raising a seed extension and the Series A at once, um, or one like right after the other, like, oh, we're raising the seed extension and in two months we're going to raise the Series A, is just not a very appealing proposition for investors. So making sure that that you sort of separate them out, at least semantically, <laughs> to investors is important. Um, it just makes the deal sound risky. It makes it sound like you don't really understand how to manage your cash. And frankly, it just incentivizes me waiting because I'm going to have a good sense that in two months, you're, you're your business is probably not going to have changed so much that your valuation is going to be that different. So I might as well wait. Um, so you need to create some incentive for investors to step in now. Um, this is actually an email that my co-founder, Julie, got pretty recently. It basically says, hey, how are you? Um, any availability ability to catch up in coming weeks? Uh, feel free to suggest days and times. Uh, you know, Wanted to get your feedback on strategy for scaling up and fundraising for seed round and series A. Um, I promise you that's a deal breaker. That just sounds kooky. And, and investors get pitched by so many businesses that are spot on in the series A that if there's something that's a little bit off, they're probably going to pass. Hey, everybody, let me take a minute to tell you about the Meeting Owl by Owl Labs. It's a 360-degree video conferencing camera that helps remote participants actually hear and see everything happening during a meeting. Yes, it captures the whole meeting in 360, and it automatically focuses zip, zip, zip on the person and the people who are speaking as they speak. So you can automatically, if you're a remote participant, zoom in and automatically see who's speaking. And uh, you know, meetings are terrible. You know that. If you've ever been on a meeting, if you're not in the room, you're a second class citizen. But uh, that's because the technology hasn't been there. 
Everybody wastes a ton of time setting these things up. You can't see in here, and everybody's frustrated. You never can follow the discussion, and then everybody winds up going back to the chat room or defaulting to email. It's a total pain. And the meeting out completely changes that. You can see the whole room. You see the facial expressions. You get the, nu the nuance of the conversation, and you get that visual context. And everybody becomes more engaged, and then you have a productive and probably a shorter, more efficient meeting because people aren't saying, what did you say? Who said that? People in teams uh, that are remote are super effective. Everybody knows that there are tons of smart people out there who want to work from home or work remote, and you want to be able to leverage that, but you also need the technology, and you need to invest in the technology, like the Meeting Owl by Owl Labs, in order to do these meetings right and not create a two-tier system where the people working remotely are second-class citizens. It's so easy to set up, USB to computer, no software downloads, it just works. And you can use it with whatever video conferencing system um, you already use. So that is something I didn't understand, but if you're using, uh, you know, the Google platform or, you know, whichever meeting uh, you want to use, it's just like a webcam. You plug it in by USB and it just gets, you can just hit the drop down and select it. So that is the brilliance of this product, the Meeting Owl. You can go check out the uh, Meeting Owl by uh, Owl Labs by going to owllabs.com slash twist, owllabs.com slash twist. That's O-W-L-L-A-B-S dot com slash twist. Use the promo code twist and you'll get expedited shipping and a free gift. That's right, expedited shipping and a free gift. That's owllabs.com slash twist. Thanks again to our friends uh, at Owl Labs, and thank you so much for uh, creating the meeting, Owl, because we use it all the time. It's super cute, it's super affordable, and it's a great product. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. Another deal breaker, weak team. Um, I know you probably hear this all the time. You know, Investors want to see a complementary team. That obviously means depth and breadth of experience, but it also means time working together. They want to know that your CTO didn't just start last week um, because so many early stage companies, uh, success or failure hinges on team dynamics. And so getting a sense that you guys have some real culture that you've been able to build is important. Um, and something you should keep in mind, probably when you raised your seed round, your investors only met you. Um, for your Series A, it's likely that they're going to want to meet your whole team. They may just even show up in your office one day. Um, so spending some time to prep your whole team to speak knowledgeably about their specific roles, but also how they work together and their understanding of the vision of the business is important. Um, obviously, they aren't all going to need to speak knowledgeably, nor is it appropriate for them to talk about like every detail of your finances <laughs> that may be above their pay grade, but just having them be able to speak confidently and not seem awkward. Like sometimes we'll invite a team in and, and they sort of like don't know how to sit together and they cut each other off. And it's just, um, it makes you wonder about what they're like in the office. Um, investors also want to know that your team is ready for growth. That means everything can't be handled by one person. And where we see that often manifest itself is with a very sales oriented CEO. So you may have a CEO who's just like killing it with sales, but you need to be able to demonstrate over time as the CEO has a growing list of responsibilities and can't handle sales on their own, that you can bring someone else in to, to help augment that work. And your first sales hire, your first couple of sales hires is probably the, one of the hardest things you will ever have to deal with bringing on. Um, so having somebody else and being able to say like, look, we've been able to identify an excellent candidate, onboard them successfully, and we can demonstrate that they've been able to replicate the success of the CEO in terms of sales. That's a really strong signal for an investor to sort of understand that you guys are ready to really, you've, you've got a playbook to, to grow. Um, they also want to likely see that your team is uh, geographically co-located and um, obviously full time. I know it's really fun to like work from home or travel or whatever, but um, if you're asking for over a million dollars from somebody, they want to know that you have a zip code and somewhere where they can show up and see what you're doing. So just keep that in mind. Another deal breaker, bad market trends. Um, so this could take a couple different forms. Maybe you have no exits in your space. I mean, investors ultimately are pattern matchers. They want to see companies that look exactly like some other company that's already had an awesome exit. <laughs> um, so if you're in a space where there are a few exits, um, you need to be really thoughtful about the way you approach the Series A. So um, an example I sometimes give is the water space. There's lots of opportunity in water, but historically it has not been a sector that venture has invested much in. So, you know, 0.4% of VC financing went to water companies in 2012, which is like 
Nothing, um, which means there are very few companies that have gotten big enough to have any really large exits, which is problematic. So like, even if you have an amazing business, you can't point to any market comparables that are going to sort of make it easier for investors to see where you're going to be. We're not very imaginative <laughs> people. Um, and so what you need to do if you're in that type of space is, you know, one, target sector-specific investors, those self-proclaimed water investors, um, but also look for investors in adjacent spaces that have had success. So if you're in the water space, for example, looking at investors who've had success in the electric, you know, electricity management space seems pretty logical. Um, um, there's also the challenge if you have bad exits in your space, and obviously a good example of that is the, the food space. Um, you know, there's just like the move, the... Montre plus Spoon Rocket plus Maple equals death is something that my co-founder says a lot when I bring her food companies. Um, we have a number of them in our portfolio uh, that are great. Not not bad. They're great. Um, but a lot of investors have been burned by these companies. And so if you are one of the companies operating in that space, um, targeting angels and other sort of non-traditional investors who may be a little bit more enthusiastic or open-minded to your particular business, or at the very least, targeting investors who have not been publicly burned by those types of businesses is important because it's a waste of everybody's time. Um, another deal breaker is unconvincing market size. Um, so investors care a lot about your total addressable market. And it's not just about showing that you know gazillion dollar market opportunity that you have, um, but what part of that market you can realistically capture. Um, and at the same time, even if you could capture 100% of the market, if it's a really small, small market, um, that is also not compelling to investors. Um, so the best way to kind of frame this for Series A investors is frankly, just doing the calculations yourself. Um, you need to be able to defend your assumptions around your serviceable, addressable market. Um, and here's <laughs> where everybody goes to sleep. But it's really important. The way you do it is, well, there are two ways to do it. There's a bottom-up modeling, um, and there's a top-down modeling. And everybody here needs to learn how to do this. Um, so the first strategy is a, is a top-down market sizing analysis. You basically determine the whole market size, and then you estimate what share of that market you can realistically capture. Investors, uh, sorry, investors don't like this. Entrepreneurs really do like this uh, because it tends to be more optimistic. Um, so an example would be, and bear with me here, <laughs> like 100 million people need widgets every year. If I capture 5% of that market, I'll sell 5 million widgets a year. My widgets sell for $10 each, so I'm gonna do 50 million in revenue. Makes sense. Um, the bottom up analysis, uh, you basically evaluate how you sell a product. You look at sales comparables, um, and that's how you sort of construct a market from the bottom up. This tends to be more complicated, um, but it also tends to be more realistic, which is why investors like it. So example, widgets are typically sold at pharmacies. There are 50,000 US pharmacies. Um, so far, I've pitched 100 pharmacies, and 10 are currently stocking my widgets, so I've had a 10% hit rate so far with my sales. Let's be conservative and say, I'm not going to be able to keep that up forever. We'll have that and say, let's estimate 5% uh, moving forward will stock my widgets. Uh, pharmacies currently buy an average of 100 widgets per year from me. So if 5% of those 50,000 pharmacies buy 100,000 widgets at $10 each, I'll do 25 million in revenue. Um, same product, Two different ways to size the market. Obviously, this is a much dumbed down version. Um, there are lots of resources on online to kind of help you figure it out, but I would really encourage you to speak knowledgeably about this because for Series A investors, they're looking for really big exits and you need to be able to credibly defend how you're going to get there. Okay, enough math <laughs> for the day. Uh, deal breaker cap table problems. Uh, investors are really looking for incentive alignment, uh, especially among senior leadership. And they also kind of want to understand your team culture. And a great way to kind of get a temperature on that is looking at your cap table. Um, they're looking for glaring disparities. Uh, maybe there's a weird vesting schedule or no vesting schedule. Um, they want to see that uh, the folks you say who are in senior leadership really are. So if you have a CTO who's like core to your team and only owns 1% and um, you know, your COO who's part-time has 75% of the company, there's clearly something amiss there. Um, so keep in mind that you need to kind of, your cap table should reflect the culture of your company. Um, investors also don't like crowded cap tables. It kind of indicates that you don't have great judgment around protecting your ownership. And if you're not going to protect it for yourself, you're certainly not going to protect it for me. Um, so just to kind of level set here, typically during the seed stage, you're raising somewhere around 
uh, 500K to $2 million, and you've probably given up somewhere between 20 and 33% of your company. Um, if when you're raising a Series A, those numbers are wildly different, uh, that could be a deal breaker. If you've given away 75% of your company already, um, there's not a whole lot left to give up, um, which can be a problem. Investors also want to see that you don't have a lot of random people who are no longer involved with the business or advisors on the cap table. You may have a very good reason to have, you know, parted ways with someone or you have brought on an advisor who can provide some strategic value. But if you have 15 of them, and we've definitely seen those companies, it just kind of indicates that your your judgment is flawed. Um, so that begs the question, how do you fix a cap table that you've screwed up? Unfortunately, it's, it's just not that easy and it's not always a legal problem. Oftentimes it comes down to strategy. It could be too expensive or too complicated to get someone off the cap table. So the best way is just avoid that in the first place. Um, if you are facing those challenges, I think a good first step is always talking to your lawyer, um, but just understand they may not be able to give you the answer that you want. Um, another deal breaker, crazy valuations. They're everywhere. <laughs> um, you need to be able to defend your valuation and again, to just level set. According to PitchBook, the average Series A valuation pre in 2016 was $17 million. In 2015, it was $14 million. If you were wildly different from that, you need to be able to explain why. Um, and even if you're right on the money there, you, need, you also need to be able to explain why. But just understand that just because you think you're worth $40 million doesn't mean that you are. And just because your last valuation said that you were doesn't mean that you are now. Um, you'll find that many Series A investors um, who see too high a price or too high a cap will just walk or um, put you in a position where you have to essentially raise a down round or a seed extension, which can be really, really painful. Uh, another deal breaker, pitching the wrong people. Um, you need to figure out who the right funders are for you. Um, crowdfunding, angel investors, micro VCs, VCs, they all have very different expectations about returns, about team dynamics, about traction, about revenue. Um, and you really need to keep that in mind as you pitch your business. Um, so just again, to kind of level set, institutional investors, so those are micro VCs and VCs, typically want to return three to four X their fund, which means every investment that they make. So like a micro VC, every investment that I make needs to have the potential to return at least a hundred million dollars. Like they need, they, I'm looking for a hundred million dollar type exits. For larger VCs, let's say you have a 200, 300 million dollar fund, a billion dollar fund, um, you want billion dollar businesses. So if you can't deliver a billion dollar exit, don't go pitch Andreessen Horowitz. It's a waste of everybody's time. Um, we often get asked about impact investors and how they can potentially play a role for many businesses. Um, I would say Data shows that impact investors tend to have a strong preference for later stage investing. So even if they're really aligned, um, they may not be suitable for a Series A. Um, but even the investors who are specifically Series A impact investors oftentimes have a much longer and more arduous diligence process, um, which on the one hand <laughs> means that they can be kind of a pain in the ass to deal with. On the other hand, it means that they're very aligned with you once you get through the process and they're likely to be a great long-term partner. But it's just something to keep in mind that you know their time horizon might be different than your time horizon. So just be realistic when you approach those investors. Like if you're going to be out of cash in two months going after impact investors, um, unless you know that they're pretty speedy, um, just might not be the best strategy. Every uh, website that we create now, when we need a quick website put up, and it has to look beautiful, like the Launch Festival Sydney, which we're doing in June, we just go to Squarespace, and it is perfect and flawless. If you need to create a beautiful website, you can turn your cool idea into a new website in just minutes, showcase your work, blog, or publish content, sell products and services of any kind, promote your physical or online business, announce upcoming events, or special projects like we do. Those beautiful templates are created by world-class designers and... They have powerful e-commerce functionality that lets you sell anything online. That's all uh, included with Squarespace, all that e-commerce stuff as well. And you can customize the look and feel, the settings, uh, all just a couple of clicks away. And you don't need to have the ability to be a developer. And you're not like the old days having a developer 
uh, over having you over a barrel where you have to wait days to make a change to your website. Nope, everybody in the company can update the website. It's super easy, and uh, you can choose from over 200 .com and other domain extensions. Now they've got all these great extensions. We started using .university for founder.university and angel.university because I thought that was a cool domain name. Uh, and the analytics will help you grow in real time. Built-in search engine optimization, free and secure hosting, and 24-7 award-winning customer support. So go ahead and check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. So go ahead and visit squarespace.com, make it yourself, and make it to stand out. You can easily create your website by yourself, and you can stand out with a beautiful website. Thanks again to our friends at Squarespace. They do an amazing job. Another deal breaker, lack of preparedness. Um, be prepared and be polite. I know that sounds kooky, but you'd be surprised how many doofuses show up in my office and are not prepared or polite. Um, you should go to the investor. Don't expect them to come to you unless they specifically have asked to sort of see your facility or meet your team on site. Just, you know, assume that you're going to have to go to them. Um, do your research on the investor and their priorities so you can speak knowledgeably about their portfolio, things they've written. Um, it will go a very long way for them kind of imagining if you can articulate how you might fit in the portfolio and complement other companies in the portfolio. Um, if you're asking investors for money, you need to be prepared to respond to them regardless within 24 hours. I know one VC who, um, and this sounds very cruel, but it's actually pretty effective. She saves up all of her questions for entrepreneurs till Friday night. And she sends them out at 6 p.m. on Friday night. And the entrepreneurs that respond within 24 hours, she moves forward with. And the ones who don't and don't have a good excuse, she doesn't. Um, and she's not like a sadist. It's just, uh, you know, if you want a million dollars from this woman, she expects that you're working on the weekend because she's also working on the weekend. Um, and I'm not talking about me. <laughs> I don't do it. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, you need to be timely. These entrepreneurs, I think, sometimes don't realize that investors see literally hundreds of deals. In the last year and a half, I've looked at, our company of three has looked at 1,500 deals. Um, so um, if it's not you, it's going to be somebody else. So just keep that in mind. Um, and of course, be on time and follow up and, you know, be prepared to provide any information that they might uh, request. Um, and usually what that means is just having a data room set up. So I would encourage you, regardless of your stage, but certainly for the Series A, before you have a single investor conversation, you should have a data room prepared. So what does that mean? A data room is basically just like a shared folder, a Dropbox, box folder, whatever, that has basic diligence materials that a typical institutional investor will expect. So these are your you know, charter documents, your founder and key employee stock purchase agreements, your cap table, confidential invention, uh, information and invention assignment agreements, your latest pitch deck, your financials, anything that investor might realistically want to see um, in order to sort of judge the state of your business. Uh, another deal breaker, not enough time. Um, you need to leave yourself enough runway to do a good job because um, panic is not a good look on entrepreneurs. Um, we typically tell entrepreneurs to raise uh, 18 months of runway when possible. I understand that that's oftentimes a stretch, but do your best. The idea of being give yourself a year essentially to be able to kind of level up as much as possible in terms of your performance and then six months to realistically go out and raise. I know you may hear from investors or whoever, I don't know, lore on the street that there's, you know, you go out and you raise your Series A in two days and, you know, it just was magical. It's not. It's a slog. It's a slog for everybody. It can take three months, six months, nine months. Um, so just keep in mind that it's, it's, it's going to be messy, probably. Um, definitely encourage you to, to uh, identify one person, senior person on your team to kind of spearhead that process. They should be at all the investor meetings. They should be tracking through one central document. What we found really effective, because we usually start with pre-seed and seed stage investing. So when we're investing in the Series A, it's usually a follow-on investment. Um, a lot of our entrepreneurs will actually share kind of like a central tracking document with all the companies or the, the investors that they're looking at. So we can kind of quickly go through and say like, oh, I know that person. I'm happy to make an intro or this is what they like to see. Or we just had some other company pitch them and this is the type of the feedback they gave. Um, ooh, someone has a meeting. It's not me. Um, you just want to make sure that your investors are being as helpful as they always say they want to be. 
Um, and, you know, having it in a central document where you can track, make sure things don't fall through the cracks, because um, that would be the worst. Um, that begs the question, when is it time to stop? Um, I would say, well, obviously when you're out of money, but um, frankly, actually, we sometimes see entrepreneurs or we often see entrepreneurs give up too soon. Um, I'm just warning you ahead of time, the Series A is is can be a very painful process. It can be a long process. Um, and you shouldn't be surprised if it takes longer than you thought. Um, so you're just going to kind of have to gut it out. Um, at the same time, you don't want to be forced to like surprise fire everyone in your company on a Tuesday. That would be really painful. So um, again, just as the previous speakers were saying, it's a question of judgment. You need to kind of weigh when is the appropriate time to quit, but hold out if you can, because you'll never know where your, your Miracle Series A investor might come in. Um, in terms of best practices for winding down your business, if you do end up doing it, communicate with your investors. First of all, you know when you first feel like you're in trouble, or even before then, you should be talking to your investors because you never know when they can step in and, and really hopefully help you out of a jam. Um, but also, you know when you are finally done, you need to tell them in person, or at the very least, over the phone. Um, because... If you start another company, um, you, you want those investors back with you. And uh, Jason and I have had this conversation many times. Like if you have a really, if you have a really amazing entrepreneur who did everything they possibly could to try and make it work and it just didn't work and they handled it like a pro and they were communicative and I just felt like they were a real class act. Like he and I will say all the time, like, I can't wait to invest in that person's next company. But if you just send me an email that goes, whoops, it's done. Like, I promise you, you're dead to me and dead to everyone that I ever talked to about you. Um, because, um, it's unprofessional and we had a business relationship. I don't expect you to do superhuman things, but I do expect you to be a good business partner. Um, and of course give your employees notice. They, um, they trust you and you have, you are responsible for their well being, And so helping them find the next thing as best as you can is, is important. <laughs> that was really, okay. That was a very depressing way to end a talk. So I'm not going to end it like that. I'm going to say it's going to be okay. Uh, you just have to stay focused on the things that matter. You know, a rigorous commitment to business execution, thoughtful preparation of materials, uh, thorough understanding of investor priorities and market concerns, and enough time. And you'll be fine. It'll be great. It'll be the best Series A in the world. So with that, is, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Thank you for sharing the insights. I have two questions, actually. One is, is, is it OK to have both top-down and bottom-up approach for the market sizing? And you can, because there will be some discrepancy between the two. It will come out to be a different number. So that's one. Second one is the advisors when you have, and you give them a portion of the company that could be from your options pool. So does that still impact like how crowded your cap table looks? Uh, so the. First question, which was the first question? I forget. Um, do you like to see both, oh, both. top down and bottom up? No. I would say you just pick one and you stick with it. I would say, especially if you're operating in a space with few market comparables, you need to do a bottom up approach um, just because uh, it will be hard for you to get the data you need to effectively do a top down. Um, I think just having one good market sizing is is enough. Um, advisors just generally, I don't care where the shares come from, if they show up on the cap table, it's just a little questionable. Like you don't, if they're that great, you should bring them in and have them as a team unless there's one specific, you know, everyone has an advisor or two that they um, have on the cap table, have been providing real value and that's fine. That's excellent. I totally makes sense. But we see many companies who have many sort of random people who like gave me advice about how to find office space in 2012 and you're like why are they on the cap table um it's that type of judgment where you sort of say like this is your company and your ownership if you're giving it away for anything that's a problem and if you're taking it away from employees who you know you could be giving that option pool to you know your second engineer i would rather you be doing that than giving it to some rando that you met in st louis you know whatever so question for me, uh, assuming that you are uh, taking into account 18 months of run rate at the seed round, when is a good time to start looking for the seed uh, series A? Because, you know, from what I hear, the CEOs are constantly looking for money. And uh, is there a 
but plus at the same time you need to focus on different things so. great question i mean it's a it's a balancing act i mean i think smart ceos are always thinking about how to get money it's like i like to see some hunger at the same time if you're always out there fundraising there is this sort of phenomenon of investor fatigue where they just sort of think if you're always out here then i can just wait and you'll be out here in a year and, and i'll i'll just wait a little bit longer um so i think you know having a discrete period where you are out of the market from fundraising is good um, that doesn't mean you can't have investor conversations during that time where you specific, like the best conversations I always have are with entrepreneurs who tell me they're not raising because it makes me want to give them money um, because it, it sort of indicates a level of self-sufficiency and um, strategy that I want to see with an entrepreneur. So, I mean, as much as very few seed companies after they do their seed close end up having 18 months of runway, I'll say, at least not that I tend to see. Um, but give yourself time out of the market to hit some real milestones um, before you go actively soliciting money. That doesn't mean you can't build relationships with investors during that time, but keep them as separate as you can. So wait until you can brag about certain milestone before you start looking for the seed, Series A or... Well, yes. I mean, Series A has comes with real metrics and expectations. It's not like a seed round where you're pitching a, a dream. It's not like that. Um, but I think maintaining relationships with investors, regardless of whether you have some like real update, um, is is great. Thanks. Um, all the acquisitions in my space, similar to my company, are all private. Are there any strategies for figuring out what those valuations were? Oh, we're dealing with that with a company right now who's just received an acquisition on offer. Um, targeting other investors who have invested in either those specific companies or in that space and ask them for comparables or just say, like, you don't have to tell me that specific company, but give me a range, um, I think is is what we end up doing a lot. Um, and so it's hard to put in a deck that, like, mysterious investor A said, you know, that this should be around 30 to $50 million. But if you can say, you know, we did a survey of the you know, five of the leading investors in the sector who gave, you know, if you have this amount of revenue, this is what they would want to see. Um, I think what we, unfortunately, it just, it becomes harder to use comparables and you end up having to do some kind of revenue multiple. And so like for this particular business, we ended up saying like, it was a combination of this is how much revenue they did this past year. Plus if they joined your company, this is how much revenue we think they could do in the next five years. Um, give us half of that. Like we'll split that with you. And that was uh, pulled that out of the air, but it was based on real numbers and real calculations and a real sort of sense for how that could work. And the idea being like after five years, uh, you'll be so integrated with the business that it will be harder for you as a sort of acquired entity to take credit for that value anymore. But let's say five years is like the right time to sort of, you'll still be kind of integrating yourself into that business. Um, a, what you'll find from acquiring companies in that space is that they will then hold you to that. They'll probably have an earn out of some kind, um, but that's just kind of the way it is. Yeah, hi, Clara. Thanks, this is fantastic. Uh, quick question for you on sort of cap table. What's your opinion of having a corporate VC in your A round, either leading it or maybe you know being the one you're sort of standing on saying, hey, look at me, I got a corporate VC versus a private VC. Does that make you shy away or is that, what's your feeling on that? No, and actually I think Jason has talked a lot about this and I think he's right in that um, corporate VCs have a very bad name historically for being kind of lazy or uh, ill-informed or slow or whatever, but I think um, they're getting quite sophisticated and they're oftentimes uh, very closely connected with the M&A divisions within large companies and so it can be a great uh, partner to have on boards. Like we have a company right now um, uh, called Apana. They're like a hardware software solution for uh, large commercial and industrial customers who have big water bills. So like Costco is one of their big customers. They helped them save, I want to say, 23% of their water bill last year. Um, and that round was led by a large Japanese publicly traded water company. Um, and we're really excited to have them on board because they have the kind of industry connections and obscure... Uh, water knowledge that we just don't have. Um, and so for us, it made a lot of sense to sort of say, like, we can bring very traditional sort of venture guidance to the table, and they can bring a lot of industry guidance. And it's a really strong signal for us that they wanted to lead the round. So I think that people's feelings about uh, corporate VC is evolving. That's not to say they're all created equal, but I definitely think that it's changing. She's right. Um, and I think the issue you have to think about is, will they ever compete? And so... 
in the case of Uber taking the Google investment, when they took the Google Ventures money, they knew that Waymo existed. It wasn't called Waymo, but they knew they had self-driving. And at that time, people thought, well, self-driving is really far away, 20 years. And if it's 10 years, we'll buy their technology. And that relationship soured. But Waymo's doing great. Uber's doing great. Even in the, if that's the worst case scenario, for the love of God, please bring me more situations like that. It's my top investment, right? Like so, and I think they'll probably, um, they, and they had to remove them from the board at a certain point and that kind of stuff. It sounds crazy. Like, oh my God, it's going to be insurmountable. It's actually pretty simple discussion among humans. We're competing with you now. We're going to resign from the board. This happened with Google and Uber. It happened with Google when they were an upstart and Apple. Apple had um, Eric Schmidt on their board, conflict of interest. Oh, we found out about Android. You bought Android? What is Android? Oh, and then Steve Jobs was like, I'm going to sue Apple until the end of time. Um, I'm gonna, Steve Jobs said, I'm going to sue Google until the end of time. And um, Yeah. So they're generally very sophisticated now. A lot of very sophisticated ones out there. Just so, Clara, interesting. Um, you talked about you know you've got to know who you who the right investors are, and you sort of said VCs looking for a billion dollar um, valuation, and uh, your fund would be looking for something in the neighbor of a hundred million. You know, I, I feel like I've talked to uh, investors at earlier stages, including micro VCs, including angels, and sometimes it feels like they're all looking for the Twitter, they're all looking for the billion dollar you know kind of exit. Um, realistically, when folks in your position look at deals, even though you've obviously sort of differentiated yourself from the VC expectation. You know, are you and folks like you still really just looking for a billion dollar company and you'll sort of settle for a hundred million dollar exit? Or do you really sort of, you know, do you sort of live by that distinction, I guess, is the question. I think it depends upon the investor. For us, we have sort of a variety of, of uh, we have two real strategies. One, um, we look for these very like sexy, high profile deals in spaces like autonomous driving or the blockchain, um, where we feel like we have a unique value add or insight into that space. So we provide regulatory and political guidance to our companies in addition to capital. Um, and so those sort of sexy deals where there are like a ton of other investors out there that could be a billion dollar exit, it's going to be great, but we have some unique value add, we will pursue those deals. But we also really like these unsexy spaces like early childhood education and water management that where there are fewer historical sort of market comparables or investors in the space that may not be a billion dollar company, but if they get bought for $300 million, like I would be very happy. Um, and where we would likely command a larger ownership stake. Um, and so it's really a mix. Like if I own, you know, 5% of a billion dollar company, but I also own 15% over time of a smaller exit, like that mix works for us. And so I think what you'll find is most investors have, at least if they're smart, have sort of a a variety of deals types that they're looking for but i mean if you're going to like trinity ventures like they have billions of dollars like they're not gonna they're not gonna be happy with a hundred million dollar exit whereas like if we had the right ownership percentage like we could be very happy and we could absolutely return our fund this is the key how big is their fund if their fund is a billion dollars and they own 20 percent of your company right and you sell for a billion dollars you've now covered 20 percent they're 20% of the way there to making their first dollar as partners in the fund. If they own 20% of your company and you sell for $5 billion, they've just returned their fund. In other words, they've made still $0, and the next company that sells, they make money. This means they can't write $500,000 checks or million-dollar checks. So understanding, knowing your buyer, knowing who's buying the shares, critical. Small funds, homebrew, you know, Claro's fund, my fund, yeah, we could be happy with smaller exits because we have at, at higher percentages and more importantly happy to put 500,000 to work or a million to work or 250k to work um so with the expectations of the angels and the seed funds and then later stage funds wanting different types of returns uh we also get different types of advice about when like we get different advice about how much money we need and how many rounds we're going to raise as an onset. Um, so like for our company, because we have good business economics and we're in insurance, if we do hit it, it scales really quickly. So we don't need, like in my plan, I don't plan on giving up past a series B really, like that's kind of the max. 
Um, but I wonder, like, what's the perception of that uh, from your end? And Jason, you can answer that too, because you're very good at telling us your thoughts. Uh, but like, uh, but yeah, like I wasn't. <laughs> I, I wasn't the only person who got that as a dig. Go ahead, Clara, answer the question. <laughs> uh, I mean, it depends upon your business. Um, if you could only, as an early stage investor, if you only raise like through a Series A or B, like that's great for me because you're you're that means I'm going to keep a larger stake in your company. Um, at the same time, being realistic is important. Like we have companies, I had a company once where they're like, oh, we only we only need 200k from you. And I was like, do you? Like I looked at your projections and really like you know you know our typical check size is between 100 and 500k like i'm surprised you didn't ask me for more money and then they came back you know 7 months later and they're like we want to raise a seed extension and i was like if you had just asked me for more money last time i would have given it to you and now i'm not going to give it to you so i think it's a, it's a weighing the you need to be realistic about how much money you really do need but you also don't want to take on too much money that you squeeze yourself out too early and so it it varies um there's no hard and fast rule but really having a strong command of what your future projections are and feeling confident that you are going to hit them will make that decision easier. One thing that people, I think, are correct in looking at is how what, what will the amount of money you've raised uh, accomplish? So not just looking at use of proceeds. Here's how we're going to spend the money. I like to look at what will be achieved with this raise. So in 18 months, you'll have 18 months of runway. What will... The business look like in 18 months. How many customers will you have? How much revenue you will have? How close to break even will you have? So I'd look at that. Most businesses, I think, if they get to an exit, they've had two, three, four rounds of funding that have diluted 20, 30% on average. And you have, if you have dual founders, they might end up when it goes public or has an exit with five to 15% each. If you have a single founder, you might have 10 to 35% of the company. Um, and that's why you see sometimes people who are in their second or third company, they're solo founders. Like Gino said, I'll be a solo founder. I know I can, I'll put the first million dollars in. I'll hire the tech team. If you're a first time founder, having tech, uh, folks, the developers on your founding team as co-founders, having three co-founders that reduces the risk, but it also reduces each of your equity stakes. So it reduces the risk for everybody. The company will keep going, but you may wind up selling the company and own 4% or 5%, which can be a bummer. Hey, right here. Uh, I know you said that lumpy revenue, of course, was a deal breaker, but this is something we're currently hypothesizing. We are testing it out now, but we feel like a lot of our sales might come seasonally. So, of course, we're in the education space, and, of course, the we feel like we might align a lot in the school system. So does that still constitute as a deal breaker, of course, because they'll still have certain spikes in metrics accordingly? No. So we, we we are investors in the education space. Like we recently invested in a company called BookNook, which is a software platform that I guess our initial market is elementary schools. Um, they help kids improve their reading skills. Um, but there are sort of two primary sales cycles for them uh, or two times of year where they, they do the vast majority of their sales. Um, it's more about how being able to indicate predictability. Like, yes, I do them every September and every May. Like, that's when it happens. It doesn't happen every single month, but you can rely that next year they're going to come back and they're going to renew those contracts. It's just about what what I wouldn't want to see is like, oh, you had, you know, one company pay upfront for 12 months and you had another company pay in three chunks and you had another company that did a six month pilot and they had to pay at the end based on performance. Like it's just about demonstrating that you have consistent pricing and that you have a consistent sales strategy that, you know, even if it is a once a year, you know, software as a service type deal, that's fine. You know, or maybe it's twice. It's just about being able to demonstrate that like I can project out where you're going to be in two years if you continue along in the same sort of sales strategy. Does that make sense? I'm not a fan of education startups. I'm a fan of education products. I'm not a fan of the educa of education startups because typically the founders self-select to people who I don't think are as cutthroat and able to build as big businesses with big profits and big returns. That's just my previous experience. But I do think there's an opportunity going direct to parents, direct to teachers to sell stuff. And it could be marginally better, like Treehouse or... Um, Lynda.com. I, I much prefer going direct to consumers to 
for education than having to deal with the sales cycles associated with schools and districts and that kind of stuff. It's a feel good investment, but I generally like, oh, it, it, I just see them all die I, on I a ex- regular basis. So it's just, I, there's so much scar tissue there. I'm super skeptical. I didn't know there was actually a differentiation between education startups and products. Actually, I've never heard that before per se. We're, we're a straight to consumer product ourselves. Yeah, so that makes it more interesting because I think parents will pay any amount of money to make their kids smarter, and consumers are getting used to paying for content and and because of the App Store and Netflix and these things. But when you start selling into a school system, I don't know. I just like, oh my god, three years and who do you have to pay off? And you know, it just feels like it's all rigged. I I, w- I will say I, we are somewhere in between. There it certainly is like a specific type of founder that self selects into that space, oftentimes and. Um, that can be a challenge, but if you find a founder who is really amazing and sales driven and has been able to make it work, like you jump on them, and that's certainly what we did with Booknook. Like I think it is a really hard space, and because of the sales cycles that sometimes exist, you know, like oh, parents are gone for three months, like we didn't sell anything, um, that can be really challenging. But um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count out the entire education sales space. No. Masterclass is another example. I passed on investing in them and it was a big mistake. I had the sense that that could be big and going direct to consumer and I think they're printing money with these different classes they do. So there's, you know, and and I spend money on educational apps all the time, you know, for my kids. So there's definitely something there. I just, boy, that sales cycle. It's like the music business. Most of the people who go and do music startups, I think they're like wacky founders who don't understand business. Same thing with the cannabis space. I see like a lot of these founders are high, like on their own <laughs> supply. And then once in a while you see somebody like, oh, Spotify. Like there's somebody who figured out how to make music work. But most people who go into the music startup space don't make it work. So having that self-awareness of I'm in a space where people have lost tons of money and there's tons of dead startups. I have to... I have to overperform if I'm a music startup. I have to really have it dialed in. If I'm an education or a health, any of those places that have incumbents that will try to stop you in a major way, it's an opportunity because if you crack through the incumbents and the challenge is you become defensible or big, but boy, is it hard. Boy, is it hard. And they have sometimes that selection process where people are like, yeah, dude, I'm doing a kind of a startup. It's going to be huge. Starbucks, you know, I'm like, can I see your website? And the website's like, yeah, we have a website, I think. You might have a website? Yeah, we put one up at some point, yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier about um, if founders don't protect their equity, they're not going to protect yours. Um, how have you seen um, that push and pull work? Is there too much, you know, give and take from the entrepreneur side, you know, what if they kind of want to retain more than you're comfortable with them retaining? Um, and how have you seen entrepreneurs navigate, you know, the later rounds effectively and, you know, when has it gone bad? Um, it's usually not a challenge. I mean, if a company is coming to us for money, like they're expecting us to take up part of their cap table. So that's not so much of a challenge. It's usually... Um, you know, along the way, we want to see them exercise good judgment. Like we don't own enough of the company to control who you hire and fire and when you exit, um, typically. Um, and so it's, it's more about just having a, like a trusted balance. And I think where it usually comes up for early stage investors is getting squeezed out of future rounds. Um, even if you have a huge investor who's going to come in and write the, the whole round, say, but you have a strong relationship with an early investor, just being able to reserve even a small part, like, look, realistically, like they want, they want to, put in $3 million. Like, I don't have any room for you, but like we've asked them to reserve, you know, this very small amount. And of course it's nominal, nominal, but I want to indicate to you that like, I am grateful for your early support and I want to continue working with you. It's just something to think about. I mean, every round is different. I can't say there's like a hard and fast rule, but if you have early stage investors who have been, and obviously I'm biased here, which is why I'm saying that, um, if they've been a great partner to you, you want those people involved because ultimately like if they are a significant shareholder over time or they have a board seat, like they're going to be the ones to defend you when you have these like rough and tumble private equity people who come in later who don't give a shit about you. There's a chapter in the book, Jason Calacanis doesn't eat shit, about a VC trying to uh, take away my rights, pro rata rights, information rights, board seats, and this kind of stuff, and how I fought them on it. And what I said to the founder of that company was, by the way, 
if we spent the last two years building this company and this investor wants to come in now and screw me, who do you think they're going to screw after me? They're going to screw you, obviously. So why don't we go find another investor? And I told that investor, if you want to screw the people who are helping these companies get to the point at which you can do a big Series A, then you are working against your own interest in the ecosystem because I'm the point guard and I will come up the court and I will never pass you the ball again. And I'm a great point guard. I will give it to your competitors. And I'm taking this company and I'm bringing it to your competitors and you have zero unicorns and I know the people who have 20 on their wall on Sand Hill Road and I can walk in there and they know my name when I show up. I'm on a first name basis. I am going to never, I was like, went crazy on this guy. And then he wrote me an apology letter and everything worked out fine. So <laughs> screwing your early stage investor, I mean, just, we, we had Gino get up here and give this incredible talk about how, the, how curating relationships is important. If people don't value the relationships and want to screw people, like they're not going to last long in this town. It, people talk, people, if you get screwed in one deal, I have like two VCs, three VCs who I have seen not behave well and founders go, hey, Jason, I, I want to meet with these 12 VCs. I'm like, great, I'll introduce you to these 11. And they're like, what about this one? I'm like, I have some interesting experiences that I can put you in touch with the founders of companies. And I will absolutely um, damage that VC's future performance by not sending them deals. If they are gonna, if I know they're gonna screw over the founder, like what is my incentive to send you a founder if I know you're gonna treat them poorly? Or if you're gonna try to treat other investors poorly, like we need to have a functional ecosystem here. Now, of course, we have pro rata rights in our documents. The problem is the power move of the big VCs might be, oh, you have pro rata, that's great. Totally, you should do this round. I'll, I'll we won't do the round unless we can get everything and you pass on your. So that's their power move. What's happened over the years, though, is we have a big syndicate, and we can actually call them on that bluff and go, oh, you don't want to respect our pro rata? Okay, you don't want to do the round now? Great, I'm going to go to these 10 other firms, and I'll put a million more dollars in. Sure, I'll give them a bridge. So we have the ability to do that over time. So this is the kind of dance that occurs. But most angel investors don't even know and don't have the reputation ability or the you know, I'm not going to bring you the next, I can say them. I'm not going to bring you the next Uber. I'm not going to bring you the next Thumbtack. And it's credible, right? So. But even, even if you have an investor who is great, but who wouldn't be able to like take the place of that $3 million investment if you lost it, like having an open dialogue with your investors who you trust and they trust you, like you can usually work something out. Like fine, like you have an investor who's coming in and is like, I want to take up the whole round and you have to give up your pro rata. Like you can usually work something out. Like, as an early stage investor, I want the deal to happen. I want you to get the money that you need to succeed. And like, I can't write you a three mil $3 million check all on my own. Um, so um, you can usually work something out. It's just about having a good relationship with people so you can have those transparent conversations um, because you never know uh, what's going to happen next. Relationships. I think that's been a really, she was smart, right? I told you she was smart. She's good. Uh, keep sending me good deals. I'll keep sending you good deals. Thanks Let's for having me, guys. Applause.